So uh, I'll pick up some comments, some questions. Yes, uh, yes, that's you, Henrik. Thank you. Um, I find it difficult to think with the representative age and framing what are the risks that um, are associated with allowing uh, credit to be abundant in a sector which has essentially fixed supply. I mean, I think it's impossible to reason about the evolution of house prices without taking into consideration they are in part driven by availability of credit. So the fact that the policy makes it more difficult for people to pay um, for young people to buy houses ignores the fact that house prices may be even higher if there were more credit. So I find it a bit puzzling that that's not even <laughs> considered. There are also serious, uh, uh, I believe Sweden is similar to the Netherlands in many things, including a funded pension system. In the Netherlands, uh, <clears throat> as Dirk say, one in five households end up in negative equity. Um, there are, even if the economy does well, you can have all sort of idiosyncratic shocks and redistributive shocks are happening uh, throughout the working class uh, sort of uh, ability to I think in the Netherlands we had a major transition between permanent employment and much more temporary employment. I think the risk build up exactly when you allow individual income uh, to become a more and more leveraged. Uh, so quite frankly, I don't think the representative agent is a particularly useful way to think about the problem we create. Um, the Netherlands, like uh, Sweden, need to finance this massive amount of mortgage funding by, uh, by banks by borrowing all international wholesale market. Uh, because indeed, the households are relatively, uh, uh, they have good savings, but they're all locked into the pension system. So all in all, I don't see, I don't find that uh, this representative uh, agent notion uh, particularly assuring. I also disagree oh, yes. that in a, in, a, in a crisis you would expect interest rate to fall. It depends what the nature of the crisis is. Yeah. Yes, Lars, I think. Uh, okay, I mean, um, importantly, uh, the mortgage market report, the commendable, commendable mortgage market report that the FSA is doing every year, which I think is a model for the rest of the world, it uses individual uh, data, not the representative agent. And, and the stress tests done there uh, are, are done on that individual data. And the result is that the households are extremely resilient and the resilience is growing over time. When you look at, uh, when you look at the numbers, it's, it's, it's quite amazing. Uh, uh, and and the, mortgage, the mortgage market report is also monitoring the lending standards. And, uh, and uh, uh, the reason the resilience and uh, the debt service capacity is so high is that uh, lending standards have been very high over the years before uh, uh, the tightening that happened the last couple of years. So even when I showed uh, the, the case uh, of uh, the person who earned 26,000, uh, he could actually, he or she could actually pay a 6% interest rate. Uh, uh, so that was uh, the discretionary income calculation interest rate used in that case. But it is not that credit is abandoned. It is not that credit standards mm -hmm. have been falling. They have been rising over time, uh, but they have been taken to an extreme level with the last couple of, of actions by. That, 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 that is my point. But it's it's, if you see lending standards falling over time, then you probably have a problem. Mm -hmm. They need to be high and preferably somewhat rising. And, and you have to look at the individual data and the whole distribution of households. You tend to know exposed by the lending standards. Sorry, uh, louder. Uh, no. Was it? Can, can I uh, um, raise the point on pension funds? Uh, you're completely right there, Enrico. As economists, we have argued for a long time, take a bit of your pensions as equity for your housing. Mm. That would make a lot of sense. You have 
on both sides smaller balance sheets like Germany and you're less sensitive to financial shocks. What happens in practice? Uh, mortgages are from the Ministry of Housing and uh, Finance. Uh, pension is from the Ministry of Social Affairs and then we have the usual government in Urtia that nothing happens. But it will be a huge improvement uh, without any cost to use your pension fund as down payment as equity for your mortgage, for your house. Other interventions? Or, yes. Yeah. Um, isn't there scope? John, uh, and Roger. Isn't there scope for basic collaboration between the fiscal authorities and the monetary authority? I mean, in in um, Denmark, um, in 2001, they made the big mistake of uh, stopping the linkage between the market price of, of housing and, and property taxes, and they're now reintroducing that linkage because of the aftermath of the financial instability that the removal of that stabilizing force um, led to. Mm -hmm. Roger? Yeah, the, the two questions here. Yeah. Uh, so th this is a question for anyone on the panel, really. So uh, th there's a, a theme I've noticed in a lot of the talks this morning um, that have to do with either housing or, or stock market wealth. Uh, and we've seen quite a bit of evidence that wealth is important in the financial cycle. In the United States, uh, wealth is roughly two-thirds held in the form of factories and machines through the stock market, and the rest is, is housing. In the UK, it's the other way around. Uh, I'm not quite sure how it is in Holland or, or any of these other countries. Uh, but. The question, uh, or the sort of thought I have, is, is do people on the panel think that these effects are coming through uh, demand effects, uh, or are they coming through uh, the, the things that John stressed in his talk, which is collateral, which would be more of a supply side uh, view? I, I think that's an important question to be thinking about going forward. Mm. You want to take this? Um, um, the, the, there is a paper in economic policy um, which shows that banks have about two-thirds of their loans are in mortgages, so confirming your, uh, your story, and businesses anyway moving to services where you don't need money, and housing keep on rising, as Ada Turner is saying, because of lack of land supply. This, this is only going to increase. So housing becomes, if anything, housing gets bigger in, uh, in Europe because they are on the balance sheet, and in the US they are uh, getting off the balance sheet uh, collateralized, not here. So housing is here to stay. And I think the collateral mechanism, so the value of a house decides your consumption, is extremely strong. And, and I think that's where the consumption effect comes, in good and in bad times. Uh, because now we start to overconsume in the Netherlands because we feel rich with our house in Amsterdam. Uh, we can consume again. And then that's why uh, the Netherlands is at the top of economic growth in Europe again, while we were at the bottom in 2012. <clears throat> yes. May I make quick a comment, comment, yeah, on, quick comment. On, on, on Dirk's uh, very nice discussion? I think, again, one has to be careful drawing conclusions from one country to another because the housing markets are very different. The Netherlands are quite different from Sweden, with much higher loan-to-value ratios. Uh, the average loan-to-value ratio now is 63%. Yeah for, for uh, new mortgages in Sweden. That's a huge buffer on average. Very few, very few borrowers now have, have over 85% uh, loan to value most. Uh, that, that is really uh, an LTV uh, cap that is being maintained. But the important thing is to, to look at the, the, the detailed resilience uh, uh, that yeah. if I would see if I would see that those measures of resilience yeah. going down, I would be worried in Sweden. That's as long uh, as they are high and even increasing over time, I feel I feel yeah. much better. I, I think we have common ground. Uh, what really is the issue? And I, I studied uh, Ireland with Phil Lane and up to the crisis in, in Ireland, in the last few years in the run-up, you got these LTVs above 90%. And in the Netherlands, 
2008 we had the turn, so it's all in the five years buying before, that were the problem cases. All the people uh, who had already the house were not getting a problem, so it is really the ones who enter the market at the, at the latest time and at the high LTV. This combination is poison, all the others are fine. Yeah. And that's why you cannot mm. look at the average, you really have to look at the individual mm. people who come on the market. Yeah. Can I say one? Uh, yes, very quickly. Uh, if, well, Le, uh, well uh, however, we should, in Sweden we actually had a real time uh, uh, stress test. I mean, we had the, we had the financial crisis. And, uh, and house prices fell and unemployment went up uh, quite a bit, uh, fell and unemployment went up. Mm. But actually consumption was maintained, uh, export and investment uh, collapsed. But, but consumption kept uh, the economy up during the crisis. So it, at least, of course, interest rates fell too. The cash flow improved mm. uh, for, for borrowers. Mm. Let's go ahead, Peter. Only, only a short remark. I think uh, psychological factors also play a role, and I think especially in Germany, people don't like debt. Uh, and in, 10 years ago in Berlin, you could buy, in the very center of Berlin, you could buy an apartment with about 1,000 euros per square meter. Uh, so, but people didn't buy it. In, in Berlin, the homeowner ratio is about 18%. Yeah, no, it's true. The, the concept of good and bad debt doesn't exist. Schultz is Schultz. If only all, all debt is bad. <laughs> no, no, but, no. Just, just, uh, just, no, no, just before we finish, uh, I think that was, um, I mean, the conclusion here on, on that little exchange here, uh, it, uh, it's very difficult, these macro prudential instruments to implement. That's the first conclusion. It's always difficult. You always find arguments in favor or against. The second thing, I mean, is uh, uh, Lars is on the data you have. I think it's quite unique, no? When you presented all your ratios, you know, debt to assets, this is really per households or per category of households, or you take macro sort of figures. Because for many, you can really point, you know, to, the, to individuals, to households. But I'm not sure in all the statistics you show you can do that, you see. Yeah, that was the, the comments we had also from the room. I mean, is it the representative agent, or to what extent you have very detailed uh, uh, information? And uh, The graphs I showed were actually yeah. aggregates, but but the uh, market so, has all yeah, the details. Yeah, no, so I, th I think we, we need to dig a little bit more into that. Uh, because if you don't have to, I mean, the comments we understand, of course. But, uh, but that leads also, to, Vito, to the question, how can you implement these measures? All, you know, responsible in financial stability know the difficulties in also. I think, Vito, that was a very, in, these were very interesting presentation. I hope you are satisfied by this uh, first day of conference. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank you. And we, we look forward, Jean-Claude, for your comments this evening. Can you? Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, all of you. That's great. You have my email. Yeah, you have my email. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have already exchanged. <laughs>